All right, our next speaker is a gentleman by the name of Bill Mitchell. Don doesn't have his glasses on either, so I guess I <laughs> This is so bad. <laughs> it's just terrible. He's the host of Your Voice America, which airs Monday through Friday at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. He has over 280,000 followers on Twitter. He's considered one of the most influential political voices in social media today. His radio program enjoys up to 100,000 plays daily on Periscope, Facebook Live, YouTube, Spreaker.com. Your Voice America's channel is dedicated to supporting the presidency of Donald J. Trump. And if you are worn down by the hate from the left, as we've all been talking about, we can't be worn down from this, and their media sycophants, come to Your Voice America for fun, smart, and uplifting shows and interviews. Find out more at yourvoiceamerica.tv. That's yourvoiceamerica.tv. Ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure that we introduce to you Bill Mitchell. Hi, everybody. I think I need to move this mic up a little bit. Is there some way to uh, move this mic higher? My, my mouth is up here. Well, Bill, now, I'm not paid to do this. There you go. <laughs> All right. That's better. Can everybody hear me now? Is there any way that you can shrink a little bit? Yeah, I can, I can uh, depend like this the whole time. Can you guys help us out? Thanks, folks. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I'll, I'll just try to speak up initially. My name is uh, Bill Mitchell, and I spent uh, most of the presidential campaign out of Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, and I am basically a uh, living story of uh, how one small voice can make a huge difference just through social media. Uh, in the 30 years prior to becoming involved in politics, I was just an executive recruiter. Uh, I was uh, very well known in my little niche. I placed high-end IT consultants. But if you had asked anybody uh, if there's ever a newspaper article written about Bill Mitchell, the executive recruiter, they would have said, who is that, right? Uh, but uh, uh, about two and a half years ago, Donald Trump came down the escalator. And uh, I had wanted for years to have a business person run for the White House because I wanted to see what it would be like if we could apply real business principles to U.S. government, to capitalism. And uh, I was a Ross Perot friend many, many years ago before he kind of lost a little bit, went a little crazy on us. Uh, and I always wanted Donald Trump to run. He'd always tease and he'd back off. And uh, I thought it'd be more of the same this time. And I remember I was in my kitchen in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Fox News was playing in the other room. And I heard over Fox News that Donald Trump had actually announced that he was going to run. He was coming down the escalator. I could not believe it. Dropped what I was doing, went in there, and I said, man, you know what? I have got to find a way to have a voice in this election. I know if I call Rush Limbaugh, I'm never even going to get through the screener. I'm just going to get a busy signal. If I call local radio, no one's really going to hear that. How can I have a voice? And I thought, well, you know what I'll do? I'll get on Twitter. That's low barrier of entry, right? So about two and a half years ago, I joined, uh, I actually had been a member of Twitter before. I had 140 followers on Twitter. I think I tweeted about my, my cat or something, you know, prior to that. Um, and I got started, and because of my background as an executive recruiter, uh, and because I worked a national desk, I was very good at uh, catching people's attention very quickly with a short amount of words. I'd have to call an executive in their office and within about a minute, convince them to tell me their life story and to trust me with their future. So I had a, a learned a way of speaking very visually, using a lot of examples, a lot of metaphors, and this really caught on on Twitter, and my uh, Twitter account started to grow very quickly. Uh, and at about uh, uh, six months into the campaign, MIT did a study, and they ranked the 150 most influential people in American politics. And this was all the uh, candidates, all the major uh, news shows, all the major newscasters. And by some strange series of events, I was ranked number 26 in the entire nation as far as political influence. And this is just you know, sitting on, in my bedroom, putting out tweets. It was absolutely unbelievable. The only people ranked ahead of me were actual political candidates and Fox News 
CNN, all the major networks. I was, I was in a state of shock. Well, of course, this ended up uh, rocketing me into the national limelight in the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, BuzzFeed, The Atlantic, all the major newspapers started writing articles about me so I could get out there and I could start to tell the story of why Trump should be our president. And here was my entire premise. My entire premise was that 74% of Americans uh, wanted a change in, Amer in uh, our government. It was a ch what we call a change election, okay? That means that three quarters of Republicans wanted a change candidate. Half of Democrats wanted a change candidate. Remember, they were voting for Bernie instead of Hillary? Okay, so that means a big majority of Americans wanted a change candidate. There was no way in the world that a status quo candidate was gonna win the presidency when they wanted a change candidate. Hillary Clinton was status quo. Out of the last six times that we have had a uh, president run for office where it would be a third term for the sitting party, out of the last six times, five of those times, the White House has changed hands. Only one time did the White House stay in the same uh, team's hands, and that was after Ronald Reagan when George Bush won the White House. No, nobody really wanted George Bush. They wanted another four years of Ronald Reagan, but they couldn't have him, so they voted for Bush. Ronald Reagan went into that election with a tremendous momentum. He won re-election by winning 49 states. The only state he didn't win was Minnesota, 49 states, so there was tremendous goodwill for the Reagan presidency going into the Bush election. On the other hand, Barack Obama won re-election with fewer votes than he had won his original election. This is the first time in history this had ever happened. Barack Obama's goodwill was drained severely just going into this set in, into his re-election. So the chances that Hillary Clinton would come in and promise another four years of Barack Obama are almost impossible. So we knew this was a change election. And I said early on, none of the debates matter, none of the scandals matter, none of the gotchas matter. All that matters is that this is a change election. America is sick and tired of being sick and tired of the old ways of doing things. And Donald Trump is offering a brand new way of doing things. People said to me, is Donald Trump a liberal? Is Donald Trump a conservative? I said, you know what? I don't put Donald Trump into those categories. I think of Donald Trump as a resultist. Okay, no matter what is a resultist? Well, they don't, a resultist doesn't put everything through the keyhole of some purity test where every idea to be considered must have this, you know, check these boxes, right? Donald Trump in, in, instead wants to listen to all the ideas, hear all the ideas, and then pick the ones that will get to the results that he wants. In his mind, he knows how this movie ends. He's seen how this movie ends. He's a very strategic thinker. He's not a linear thinker. How does a strategic thinker work? The way a strategic thinker thinks, imagine it like a, a puzzle. Okay, and you take that puzzle and you dump all those pieces over on the table and you can't tell what the puzzle is. If you look at the, this one piece, it's a blue piece. You think, well, maybe it's a puzzle of the sky or you put this piece into a red piece. Well, maybe it's a puzzle of a red car. You don't know. The only person that knows how that puzzle looks is the person that's holding the box top. They know what the picture looks like. Donald Trump is holding the box top. He knows how he wants America to turn out. And so he can put out all these things all at once, have all these moving parts going at the same time. And it seems so confusing to the media because the media are linear thinkers. They live by the next news cycle. But Donald Trump knows how all the pieces work together. And it's remarkable his time how that even in the primaries, in, at the convention, in the general election, even now with tax reform, everything seems so chaotic, everything seems so crazy, and then right at the at right time, right at the moment uh, of victory, it all comes together and we end up winning. For the last two and a half years, say what you like about Donald Trump, but he has ended up in the winner's circle every time for the last two and a half years, and we're in the winner's circle with him. When Donald Trump said, I am your voice, you know, we called our show Your Voice America. We actually did that uh, six months before Donald Trump ever said, I am your voice. It was just fortuitous marketing on our part. But when Donald Trump said, I am your voice, what he was saying is, I am your self-actualization. I am saying out loud what you've been screaming at your TV sets for the last 10 years, when you've been seeing Republicans get on the news and not being able to fight back about the, against these liberals, that they would lob them these softballs and they would just whiff on them every time. And you'd scream at your TV set and just say, just stand up for us, somebody just stand up for us. And Donald Trump came on and said, I will stand up for you.
Do you remember that movie, uh, My Bully? Do you remember that movie? It's called My Bully. There was a little kid that was picked on, and so he hired a big kid to be his tough guy and stand up for him. In a way, Trump was our bully. He was our guy that was going to stand up against the left, stand up against the lies, stand up against the fake media, and stand up for us, and he's doing that now. <clears throat> now, Donald Trump has first, just completed his first entire year in the White House. Economically, domestically, on an international basis, this has been the most successful first year for a president ever in the history of the United States. <clears throat> it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's even un more unbelievable when you consider this, that he had the media against him 24-7. He had the entire DNC against him 24-7. He had never Trump, about half the Republican Party against him. He had Europe against him. All these powers are great against him. Who did he have for him? He had us. He had us and he had God. And I said this many times, that God plus us was enough. Was enough. Folks. This is what has made the difference in the past. They talked about the monster vote coming out for Donald Trump. What is the monster vote? Half of Americans that are of eligible age to vote don't even vote. During this campaign season, so many people were so fed up and wanted a champion to stand up for them that they came out and voted for Donald Trump when he had never voted before. I was watching the election returns that came in. My Twitter feed has about 320,000 followers now. It gets about 5 million hits a day on it. On election night, I was watching the returns that came in. I developed a reputation for understanding the way the polls worked. When that poll came out that said Hillary Clinton was 12 points ahead and couldn't lose, I said, I've looked at the internals of that poll. The internals of that poll say that Hillary Clinton is going to lose this race. Because what's happening is Hillary Clinton is winning by two to one in some major blue states that are polling heavily. But Trump is not winning two to one, but he is winning in the major red states. And we're going to win this election based upon the Electoral College. And that's what happened. But on election night, my Twitter feed received 90 million hits on just election night, 650,000 retweets. Why is that? Because we had all these people that were new to the process, that hadn't been a around the block a million times with politics, and they were on the edge of their seats. My show, Your Voice America, we call it the Suicide Prevention Squad because our job is to pull everybody off the ledge. You get beaten up by the media all day. You get beaten up by the negativity all day. You get beaten up by the liberals in your office all day. They come and they watch our show at night, and we give them the facts, we give them a positive attitude. We are so absolutely sure and confident that Trump is going to win for us at the end. They go away feeling better and they go away armed. When those uh, polls came out that had Hillary had by 12 points, remember those? And the media was basically measuring the drapes, you know, they're, they're uh, basically ordering the fireworks displays. We came out on my show and we said we we're putting our entire reputation on the line. We are guaranteeing 100 percent that Donald Trump is going to win the election for the president of the United States. And I tell you what, there must have been 20 articles written about how Bill Mitchell is the craziest guy on the planet. He's this terrible sycophant. They called me the post-fact pundit, you know, and we just loved it. It's like... We know, we know that uh, we are right. Guys like Frank Luntz would troll me on Twitter. You know what you've made in, on Twitter when the, when the famous people are trolling you, you know? The big blue checks. Frank Luntz would come out and say oh, what a crazy guy that I was on Twitter and how I couldn't possibly write. And then I remember on election night, Frank Luntz, when the returns started coming in, he said, I just wanted to go on the record right now and say that Hillary Clinton will be the next president of the United States. And I was like, uh, I don't think so. I don't think this is going to happen. So, this is what happened. We were watching uh, Florida on election night, and Florida first turned blue, and everybody freaked out. It's like, oh no. And I said to my Twitter followers, I said, don't worry. It's just Southern Florida. All those early votes they did, they all dropped all at once. Don't worry. I'm looking at the West Coast. I'm looking at a county that uh, Mitt Romney uh, lost to Barack Obama. And right now, Donald Trump is weighing, running way ahead of Hillary in that county. That's a bellwether. I'm looking at the panhandle coming in. And as it started to happen, as it started to happen, the state turned uh, red, and it stayed red. And the same thing with North Carolina, the same thing with Ohio. Nine points we won Ohio by. Ohio is supposed to be a close state. We won by nine points in Ohio. It's amazing. We won Michigan. We won Wisconsin. We won Pennsylvania. This is the blue wall. This is the Rust Belt. These are the states that we were supposed to never be able to win. I was even, I was sure Donald Trump would win, and I was even shocked that we won Pennsylvania when it came in. I remember Brett Baer on Fox News, he's saying there's like, folks, Donald Trump has just won Pennsylvania. Donald Trump is just gonna be the next president of the United States. And he had this look of disbelief. And we were just like, 
Yeah, baby. We did it. We did it. We came together. We did it, okay? So now we've had a tremendous year of victory. We're looking at 4.0 GDP for the fourth quarter of this year. We have Apple Computer, right? Apple Computer is not a big bastion of conservatism, right? They just repatriated $350 billion in the United States. They just paid $40 billion in taxes on that. That's one company. This is happening everywhere. We are looking at full employment now. What happens with full employment? I was a headhunter for 30 years. Let me explain to you how this works. When you have a government, when you have an economy that is based on uh, government largesse, on government spending, what happens? Small business people, they hire defensively. They want to hire just enough people to keep the doors open. They start seeing their employees as overhead, not as assets. They don't invest in them. They reduce benefits. Okay, they reduce vacations. They reduce salaries. And this is what we saw. The average black family under Barack Obama ha saw their incomes go down by $900 a year under Barack Obama. He was not a very effective for the black families. But in Donald Trump's first year as president, we have seen average incomes go up $1,000 per family in the first year under the Donald Trump presidency. It is unbelievable, the effectiveness of Donald Trump. In eight years, in eight years, eight years of the Obama presidency, the Fed's raised its interest rates one time because the economy had to be propped up with low interest rates. During Donald Trump's first year, the Fed has raised interest rates three times. We have seen the stock market go up 7,000 points under Donald Trump. You don't have to understand how amazing that is. When the Fed's raised interest rates three times, everyone said, that's it, the stock market's gonna crash. Here's why that is. Because when you keep interest rates low, you basically are lending free money to the institutions. The institutions go out there and they, they bid up the marketplace. It's a Ponzi scheme. They bid one against the other. And what happens is that you have the fundamental values of the company, but the uh, speculative value gets up here. You create what's called a bubble. And everybody thought, as soon as this quantitative easing, as soon as these low interest rates go away, this bubble is going to collapse. But what happened was Donald Trump came in practicing, promising tax cuts. Donald Trump came in talking about a pro business pro-capitalism idea and you know what folks Democrats will tell you trickle-down economics doesn't work trickle-down economics does work it's always worked it always will work we have another name for it. where I come from we call it capitalism all the Democrats have all the Democrats have is what we call trick them all economics we have trickle-down economics they have trick them all economics. They have to play games with their economics to make it look good. They have to have low interest rates to make it look good. We have trickle-down economics, and it's working even now. <clears throat> so the fact that the stock market went up, pardon me, folks, I had the flu last week, so I'm a little groggy here, but um, the fact the stock market went up 7,000 points when we raise interest rates three times, this should be economically impossible. This is why uh, every economist basically said the market is going to collapse under Trump, the economy is going to collapse under Trump, because they just didn't see how we could end quantitative easing and still have a rally. And yet we did. Why? Because what Trump did, instead of that bubble collapsing where the speculative prices came back down to the fundamental values of the company, because of consumer confidence, because of uh, hiring manager confidence, because of manufacturing confidence, the fundamentals of those companies rose to meet the speculative value. We filled in the bubble from the inside out, and that's why the stock market continues to do so well. So here we are one year into the Trump presidency. He had no help from never help Trump. He had no help from the Democrats, no help from the media, and yet we've accomplished these remarkable things. Now we've got tax reform done. I just heard from one of my co-hosts, I've got a team of 10 co-hosts on my, on my show. I heard from one of my co-hosts, the lovely and talented Tracy Belmonte from New York, New York, if you've ever seen her, she does a Friday night show for us. See, she's a teacher in New York, and she got her first paycheck that had the Trump tax cuts in it, $200 more in her paycheck than there had been before. And all of her liberal teacher friends are freaking out. They're like, oh my gosh, we have more money in our paychecks. And Tracy's like, what have I been telling you? What have I been telling you? So here's what's happening. You know, there's an old saying that I like. There's many, many a slip twixt the cup and the lip. This is an old middle expression. What does this mean? It means there's many unexpected things happen before you get to the final result. We're looking at 2018 coming up. Okay, November 6, 2018. This is huge. We need to hold the House. I think we're in a position to take a supermajority in the Senate. There are at least 10 Senate seats at risk for Democrats that are being held in states that Trump won 
easily. We can take a supermajority in the Senate. We can maintain our majority in the House. We can look at the second year of Trump's presidency, I'm sorry, the second two years of Trump's presidency as being the most dominant two years in any presidency in U.S. history. But we need to get excited. We need to get motivated. We need to get as turned on as we were for 2016. It's very easy to get complacent when things are going well. Let me use a Star Wars reference. I use this all the time. Star Wars, okay? The Rebel Alliance was up against the Empire. It's very easy for the Rebel Alliance to be unified when the Star Destroyers are shooting laser beams at you, right? Okay, they're blowing up your planet. It's very easy. You got one big bad guy out there, you motivate you, you unite against them. But here's what happened. I'm kind of a geek, okay? After the Star Wars movies, I read all the Star Wars books. There's like 80 of them, okay? Of the stories that happened about Star Wars. And what happened in those stories? The Rebel Alliance got comfortable. They started fighting amongst themselves. They started infighting. They lost their motivation. They forgot who the enemy was. We need to remind ourselves who the enemy is. The enemy is the progressive movement. The enemy is the left. The enemy is those who would oppose, make America great again. <laughs> Folks, I thank you so much for giving me a chance to come up and speak to you tonight. Uh, my show is Your Voice America. We're on uh, five nights a week at 7 p.m. And we're also adding all kinds of new shows, uh, The Better View. We have a show called du Two of Us America, which is a outreach to the Hispanic community. We've got a millennial show. We've got a DC Insider show. We have all kinds of great shows. Faith and Freedom on Sundays with Lee Valentine. Just lots of great stuff. So you can follow us, yourvoiceamerica.tv is our website. I love you guys. You are the beating heart of what makes this America go. And we're going to win in 2018. Thank you.